Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm the Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, all here for today's event. Um, sadly, uh, the BBC have called Michel Hussein away to Cornwall to document the coming storm. There's, a, of course, an irony wrapped up in that, given the topic for the conversation today. Uh, so, um, uh, that, but that's good news for me, because it means I can take the helm today. So... Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased by this bad news. Uh, before we begin, can you turn off your mobile... Oh, no, can you make sure your mobile phone is switched to silent, but don't turn it off because you should feel free to uh, tweet at uh, hashtag RSA News. Uh, we're li live streaming our event, so there'll be people watching remotely. He'll also be joining into that online conversation on Twitter. Now, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, um, uh, Alain de Botton needs very little introduction, so I'll keep this brief. Born in Zurich, his essayistic books have been described as philosophies of everyday life. He's written on love, travel, architecture, and literature, and his books have been bestsellers in 30 countries. Alan started, uh, also started and helps to run a school in London called the School of Life, dedicated to a new vision of education. He joins us today to discuss the impact of the 24-hour news culture on our everyday lives. Would we be happier turning a blind eye to global events, or do we have an obligation to keep up with what transpires around us? Uh, controversial and important issues, I'm sure you'd agree. So we're delighted you've been able to join us today, and Alan, please join me in welcoming Anna de Botton. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, so I want to talk tonight, uh, today, about my new book. Now, hang on. Um, yes, no, not quite working. Uh, there we are. Um, that's the new book. I wrote this book called The News, A User's Manual, in order to complicate our sense of what is going on when we do that thing, which seems so normal, which is to check the news. Do you know that the BBC website is accessed by 20 million people five times a day? So five times a day, people will go to the news and expect, well, something. What are they expecting? What's going on? Um, for many people nowadays, the last thing you um, uh, uh, see when you go to bed is the news headlines, and the first thing you see is the news headlines. Uh, when we go to school, no one really educates us into what is going on. You know, we get taught about how to look at paintings and how to look at theatre, but we don't really um, get taught about this business of looking at the news. And yet it's so weird. I mean, what is this thing that we're constantly brought into uh, contact with? Um, it's very, very weird. Now, back in the 18th century, people thought that um, news, information, if only it could be made freely available, would uh, you know, be an enlightening force and would free people and liberate nations and bring the you know, light of reason uh, where there previously been darkness. So huge claims are made in the 18th century for free information. But there's a weird thing about um, free information nowadays. And if I said to most of you, okay, what was in the news last week? Right? Most of you, I think, wouldn't know because we forget everything. I can't remember what happened in the news last week. And the reason is that there's so much of it, and it you know, flows over us. Um, what's, what's it leaving behind? What's the sediment that it's leaving behind? It's almost as though if you want to keep a population supine, addicted to the status quo, unable to grasp their sense of what is possible and what could be changed, you've got two options. One, censor the news completely, North Korean option. The other option is the option we're practicing here. Flood people with news. Give them so much news, they don't know what on earth is going on. And then you can say, well, your free information is free. And then, weirdly, no one can work out quite what's going on. And I think that's the odd sort of position we're in. I think that news has in many ways replaced religion, um, which used to be the place that you went to to find out what was right and wrong, uh, what mattered, the meaning of life, religion was the guiding force. And the philosopher Hegel says at one point in a very revealing passage, he says, a nation becomes modern when it shifts its allegiance from the church to the news. That's happened in this country uh, very much so. It's not just that we look at the news uh, uh, at the same times often as the, in the Catholic um, uh, liturgy, we would go and uh, uh, check in with prayers to God. It's that um, the bulletins really follow the, uh, the, the times rather eerily. It's not, it's not so much that. It's that we look to news for as a system of, of authority and it shapes our understanding of reality to an extraordinary degree. A very simple proof of that is if you're trying to plan a revolution, where do you take the tanks first? Always um, uh, the news station, you know, the, 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 the news channels, the radio and television, that's where you're going to go. So what I want to do today is just whiz through, because it's quite a tight schedule, whiz through some of the areas that um, I look at in the book and try and sort of complicate them. Now, 
The news used to be, there used to be this assumption that the news is about the important stuff. And um, because we live in democracies, the important stuff becomes popular. That's the idea. And then when it becomes popular, politicians who are elected by popular mandate can take action. That's the way that it should work. So uh, information, popularity, and political change. Weird thing has happened uh, nowadays. Um, there are certain things that are really, really important, like this kind of thing. Very, very important um, issue. Um, and, um, but then it's not very popular at all. If you put this on your front page, no one's going to click on it. But this is really popular. Um, so a division has opened up between Taylor Swift's legs and Arctic um, melt. Uh, and we don't know how to heal it. Uh, there's, there's been a tremendous divergence. The architecture of news has broken down. Um, what do we do about this? Well, um, right-thinking, intelligent people panic, and they say we are living in an age of barbarity where celebrity news uh, wins out and people are only interested in uh, you know, cute babes. That's the view. Now, I'm not so pessimistic because the era of cute babes has been with us for a long time. This is <laughs> Bellini. Now, if you wanted the truth just from this chap here, now uh, he's St. Jerome, right? He's got a huge beard and he's got a very important book in his hand. But if you just want to try and teach people uh, about the meaning of life through very bearded chaps with huge books, you're not going to get very far. And the Catholic Church knew this and that's why it commissioned Bellini to make some Taylor Swifts of the day um, who looked very, very beguiling and they helped to sugar the pill of important knowledge. Um, I think that's a very uh, important opportunity here. Uh, we have to recognize that um, you're dealing with an, a news audience uh, that responds uh, very well to certain issues and doesn't to others. And I think that so often news journalists are primed to think if an issue is important, if we put it out there, it must get a response. And then actually it doesn't. So if 300 people are killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo, no one will care because the story has not been presented in the right sort of way. And this is an epochal challenge for news. How do we cope with um, a, 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 an age in which an audience is distracted and won't simply respond to bits of information just because they are shocking and important? How do you make the important popular? Popularization is one of the most important skills that um, uh, news journalists could nowadays possess. Yet oddly, especially in serious newspapers, it's not taken that seriously as a topic. One of the things I said, you know, there's lots of news. There's actually not that much news. The thing about the news, though, is that it refuses to remind you of a fundamental fact, which is that there are only really a few stories in the world. Uh, in my book, I identify 32 stories. There are really 32 news stories, and they just keep going round and round. They're archetypes. The news doesn't like telling you about archetypes. It only likes to tell you about so-called original events. But there are archetypes, and what we should try and do as consumers of the news is to look out for them. So the next time a powerful man sleeps with someone uh, and their career is ruined, we realize, okay, well, that's like the other one, and that's like an eternal theme of mankind. Getting better at sorting out archetypes helps to lessen the pressure of, of news. Um, let me give you one archetype, for example. Uh, uh, this chap uh, is doing something, and it's exactly the same story as this um, person, which is exactly the same story as this person, um, uh, these people. Um, and what that is all about is ordinary people, uh, extraordinary people doing ordinary things. A very charming kind of story. It has a huge uh, emotional uh, uh, resonance uh, with people because uh, we're all afraid of power and when we see power doing something um, reassuringly ordinary like wrestling with a car seat or you know, shopping at Whole Foods um, or, or giving birth in a stable, um, uh, we, we, we are reassured that um, power uh, is sympathetic to ordinary life. So, you know, I'm just pointing out that, that example because it's an example of an archetype that runs through the news. We should get sharper at looking out for, for archetypes. I mentioned the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, great humanitarian crisis going on there now. The weird thing is we don't care. Um, so we hear about you know, 300 people uh, dying there, and we don't care. And the reason is we didn't know they were alive in the first place. You can't care about the death of someone who you didn't know existed previously. So when the news rushes to tell us you know, 50 people have been killed in Peru, um, if I said to you, okay, what is Peru? Any associations of Peru? I bet no one in this room, very few people in this room, I'm going to be proved gloriously wrong, very few people in this room would be able to summon up any images of Peru, or indeed Bolivia, or Paraguay. These are important places with millions of inhabitants. They don't make it onto the news because recently there have been no disasters there. As soon as there's a disaster there, we'll find out about these countries. That's not right. We can't create an empathetic relationship which will um, uh, stir us when there's a death. And some people say, well, it's just because we're racist. And I don't think we are racist. You know, people say, well, because, because people have got black skin, and so that's why we don't care about them. nonsense. It's just that we don't have information. And without information about the steady state of a place, um, that place's traumas and disasters can't matter to us. 
There's going to be no emotional connection. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to do something that in journalism schools they don't quite teach you about, though it's absolutely fundamental. We need art. And by art, I mean not, you know, fancy, fancy paintings. What I mean is um, a capacity to make a connection with the viewer, a, 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 a suggestion of information, or information-rich um, a way of conveying things that will touch people's hearts. Um, take photojournalism, you know, the most obvious art uh, is related to uh, uh, the news. Um, Good photojournalism, and indeed, you know, if you go to the newsrooms nowadays, um, all photo editors will say, oh, no one's paying for good photographs, no one cares about good photographs. What's a good or a bad photograph? A good photograph is one which advances your knowledge of a situation. It doesn't merely corroborate uh, a sense of something having happened. It advances knowledge. So a lot of pictures out there are dead pictures. They're simply pictures of corroboration. You know, some will say, um, you know, Francois Hollande went to Britain, and then there's a picture of Francois Hollande in Britain. Um, that the picture is not telling you anything about him, about his relationship with Britain, about what he's doing, it's just literally saying there it is. Um, but the good pictures are themselves agents of knowledge. Um, here's a wonderful picture, a very fascinating picture by um, uh, an acclaimed photographer called Stephanie Sinclair, and this is of um, child marriage in Yemen. Now, when we think, oh, child marriage, yeah, I know all about that, etc. When you look at this picture, the reason why this picture is so great is that it tells us lots of things that we never knew. For example, it's not really uh, children who are getting married, it's little old ladies. Um, by the time you've been married off to one of these guys, you, you, you age 40 years. Um, and also, oddly, uh, these guys don't look like men. They look like ch children. They don't know what they're doing either. So it's, it's odd. It's poignant. But that picture is one that you can look at for a long time and get rich information. So few of these pictures, because we, we've downgraded our sense of photography as an information-bearing medium. Think of the president. Um, Obama, we've seen him so many times uh, in these pictures. This is a dead picture. It's not telling you anything. There is no information uh, in this picture. There's a wonderful White House photographer called Pete Souza, who Obama met when he was a young senator and made friends with him. And he's now in the White House and he sends, uh, puts pictures up for free uh, on the White House um, blog uh, every week. Wonderful uh, pictures. Now, we know lots about Obama. Uh, we know lots of things that he can fake. He fakes things to get elected. We didn't quite know that he could fake things in order to please a staffer's um, desire to uh, act as Spider Man. But that that's what he's doing here. Um, it's cute, it's interesting, and we're learning something um, about the president and his personality. So it's a, it's a photograph of information. It's a new kind of information. Um, now, there's something else about the news that's become very uh, prevalent of late. Now, most of the time, as we navigate through society, um, we think that people are quite nice. And, you know, you guys are nice, and I'm quite nice on a good day, and so everybody's quite nice, and it seems all very, very friendly, until um, we go below the line. And then extraordinary uh, insights are reached. Everybody's nuts. They're completely crazy. Uh, they're shouting. They're ranting. This is, this is, uh, 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 this is something about uh, George Osborne. And literally, I mean, there are people who want to throttle him, kill him. Someone guy wants to sit on him with a cushion. I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. What is going on? Uh, is, this, is this the truth about humanity? Um, no, I think this bears the same relationship to the truth as a journal does about your life. Now, you know that mood when uh, you know, things have gone a bit wrong, and you go up to your bedroom, you pull out your journal, and you say, you know, I hate my partner, and I hate my life, I'm going to kill myself, and I hate everything, etc. And you're you know, weeping, and the tears go on the, the ink. I'm just being autobiographical here. And then <laughs> you, you, know, you put the, the diary, the journal away, and you don't want it really read, because it doesn't reflect a fundamental fact about you. It simply reflects a, a moment in, in, in your life. And, and, and it shouldn't be read, because it would so distort everyone's understanding of who you are, it would be very unhelpful. And that's why um, I very much advise no one ever to go below the line, because um, it's very important that we be able to go out into the world, trust people, do business with them, exchange ideas, and it becomes very hard to, to fall in love, to, to build connections with people once you know what humanity might be like from some of these stories. So be very, very careful of them. They're extremely uh, dangerous. Now, another thing that happens when we look at the news is um, we see a lot of disasters. And are we sick? Are we crazy? Um, this man Man killed his son. Um, he was unemployed. Uh, he um, uh, got desperate with his wife. His wife was going to leave him, etc. Killed the son. Killed his daughter. Uh, they were found in a layby in a Saab. Uh, one leg of the child poking out of the window. It is horrific. And when, yet, when uh, the Daily Mail ran this story, it got one of the highest uh, audience figures of recent history. Are we completely nuts? No. We're not, but we are very, very gripped by stories that we could call tragedies. And um, there's a long history of this. Uh, this is uh, Oedipus, a performance of, of Oedipus. And, you know, we have to go back to the Greeks. And Aristotle made this famous distinction between horror and tragedy. And he pointed out that um, uh, uh, there's a distinction, there's a difference between a story that he could call a horror story and a tragedy. A tragedy is a way of narrating 
um, a momentary loss of control in somebody's life, which brings them down, an, a fatal flaw, an error, which brings them down um, and ruins everything. And there is supposed to be a therapeutic impact on the viewer from looking at a tragedy. So even though tragedies tell of appalling things, they are agents, in Aristotle's view, of civilization. Um, we become civilized um, because we recognize, A, how close we are to disaster, and so we become humble and sympathetic to others. Um, and, uh, and B, we become kinder. So there's a kind of fear and pity, um, uh, the results of tragedy, uh, help to make society better, which is why the ancient Greeks believed in the need to go and look at um, tragic events on stage. These were part of um, a, a civilizing process. Now, the problem with a lot of news, and this is my angle on a lot of news, is it takes us almost to the edge of something interesting and then doesn't do the next step. So when you're reading this story, you're not actually inducted by the Daily Mail into the possibility. The Daily Mail is so scared of fear and pity. Um, it's so scared, really, of law and order breaking down. It thinks that we can't make a distinction um, between uh, sympathy and wanting to keep someone in prison. So it thinks that we, you know, if we get too close to this man's um, uh, life, we will want to let him out of prison. In fact, he, sorry, he killed himself as well, so not an issue in this uh, area. But th th there's a sort of feeling that any sympathy to uh, people who have done terrible things will lead to uh, a breakdown of, of society. So far from it, um, uh, that's absolutely what we need, I think. Um, but we're finding, we're finding it hard in our society. You know, people say, oh, people are so interested in gory news. Um, most of Western literature is about gory news. It's people who've killed people, jumped in front of trains, um, you know, spent all their money and done awful things. It's all the stuff that you'll find in the Daily Mail. But the thing is that it's been handled in a certain way. And, um, you know, sometimes serious people go, oh, it's awful how in modern society people are interested in, you know, horrible, gory things when there are really important things going on like, uh, you know, Arctic ice melting. And, you know, my response to that is to go, look, there's nothing trivial about these sort of issues. They're deeply serious and they're deeply, they could be agents of all sorts of quite good things. They're just being handled in the wrong way. Let me give you another example. Another very, very popular kind of uh, story is this kind of story. Crashes, accident. We love a good accident, um, particularly when a plane crashes, you know, off the scale popularity when something like this uh, uh, happens. What's going on? Are we monsters? Are we sick? No. We're trying to find the meaning of life. Um, you know, in the Middle Ages, it was seen, and the early modern period, it was seen as a very acceptable and did indeed necessary part of interior decoration that you would put a skull on your desk or a painting of a skull on the wall um, in order not to make you despair about life or to be ghoulish, but precisely to bring to the fore the most important issues in your life. Death is not, the thought of death is not merely a depressant or a, a, an argument for giving up. Uh, it is a tool by which we start to focus on what really matters. Um, and, um, and so it's very, very important. This is a memento mori. Um, this is also a memento mori. These are modern memento moris, but they're not used that way. So again, um, I, as an observer, as a reader of the news, think you know, the news is taking us to the edge of something very interesting, but is denying us the proper kind of uh, response. Now, the other thing the news does is make us scared all the time about everything. You know, bird flu and this flu and that flu and uh, etc. Um, what's going on? Why is it um, uh, trying to uh, uh, to make us, you know, so scared? Um, th the impact is huge. I mean. All of us know situations when um, we've ended up maybe, you know, we've broken down on the edge of a country road um, and, um, you know, we talk to a stranger. Uh, we're forced to go up to a stranger and say, you know, my car's broken down or I'm lost, etc. And um, the feeling at that moment is always, I'm going to be killed uh, because I'm talking to a stranger. And we think that strangers are all paedophiles and perverts and murderers because that's what the news tells us that they are. And there's always that thing, oh, strangers are quite nice, really. You know, the train, everyone was quite nice. And of course, that's the great secret that the news will never tell you. People are quite nice. Of course they are. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't really sell information. So it, the news takes us through these terrible cycles of fear, Constant fear, 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 fear. Um, and then, of course, the odd hope. And the hope is centered always around science and technology. So the new iPhone and uh, the new pills for curing Alzheimer's. And if you eat walnuts, you might cure cancer. And if you wear some kind of sock, you might uh, you know, be cured of kidney disease or whatever. It goes on and on. Always the idea that above, uh, you know, over the horizon, there is some cure to, to, to the problems of life, the problems of, of, of existence. Um, and so it cruelly, the news constantly gives us hope. It does this with politicians as well, of course. You know, this politician will solve everything. Um, and then it dashes the hope uh, and makes us angry. So fear, hope, anger. Um, it doesn't make us pleasantly, agreeably 
melancholic. You know. um, the great thing about Christianity, I speak as a secular Jew, um, is that it had a kind of policy of, look, life is fallen. We are fallen creatures. We're imperfect. Um, and we're extremely vulnerable to, to things. Um, but that's the norm. So rather than exciting us at every point with an image of perfection and then dashing us against the kind of shoals of disappointment, um, uh, there does seem to be a real need as an audience of news to get our sense of perspective. Perspective is so hard to reach vis-a-vis uh, uh, news. Um, I mentioned a little bit uh, about celebrities and our concern with them, but this is obviously something that people are very worried about when they think of news, that um, there are many celebrities who seem to be taking our society in the wrong uh, uh, direction. Um, and serious people, again, think that we've become corrupt because we are obsessed by celebrity. Now, my view is it's not that we're obsessed by celebrity that's the problem, it's that we're obsessed by the wrong celebrity. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with celebrity. If we're really what we mean is role models, a good society needs role models. Serious people are a little bit uncomfortable around role models. There's this assumption that you should just make yourself without reference to anybody else, just an original creature sprung up from the earth like a mushroom. Um, but you're not like that, really. You, we do take guidance from others. And it's very important as a well-functioning society that we get the right models around. But because serious media doesn't engage with this th side, it just abandons the process of anointing people as celebrities to the lowest common denominator. And, and that's why we uh, end up with with where we are. Um, but there are you know, more optimistic signs. Um, uh, you know, this is Natalie Portman taking her two-year-old child to the park. Now, going to the park's really boring, um, but it's very nice when Natalie Portman, uh, who's very glamorous, takes her child to the park. Because you think, oh, well, that's quite sweet. That's quite nice. Um, maybe going to the park's OK. Um, uh, she is, as it were, a saint of going take your child to the park. She's an sort of honorary saint for, for a secular age. And of course, you know, for most of um, history, we were surrounded by saints who would either be the saint of this and the saint of that, etc. And we're still searching through the embers of um, uh, uh, modern celebrity culture. We're still searching for role models. It's, it's an urge that's there, and yet the, the news seems to me to handle really quite badly, missing out uh, an enormous opportunity. Now, um, other things. Uh, you know, on the weekend, the news is a little bit slower, and uh, you get the supplements, and they're glossy, and um, there's a sort of assumption that, that you could do this thing called relax with the Sunday papers. And uh, you know the mood, you, you go get the Sunday papers, and uh, you open up the supplements, and you're supposed to have a, a, a good time, the sun is shining, the birds are tweeping outside, and um, then you start to, to, to read certain stories. Now, often... Um, in the news sometimes, they, they, they used to, well, they still do, they still say things like, you know, um, strobe lighting, warning, strobe lighting, and you know strobe lighting's coming, you should be careful. Now really what there should be uh, in a lot of news, particularly the Sunday newspapers, is envy warning, envy, envy warning is about to come. This man is Elon Musk, he's worth $10 billion, this is his wife, she's gorgeous, she's lovely, um, and um, you read this story and he founded PayPal and eBay, and uh, he's sending people to Mars soon, and he's really doing well, and there have been lots of articles about him, and we're supposed to be delighted to read about him. I'm not delighted at all. This man drives me completely nuts because he's 46. You know how it is, you always look at the ages of people. And you know, you used to think, okay, well, that person's older than me. So of course, maybe by that time I get that age. And the terrible thing about middle age is that you can no longer use that thing. I mean, I'm not, not gonna do it in the next two years. So it's really, really uh, uh, tough. Um, we don't have, the news constantly makes us envious because it's constantly putting in front of us people who've achieved extraordinary things. And because we live in mobile societies which are deeply aspirational, um, it takes a very hardy soul to think, oh, well, I'm really not interested, that's not for me. Um, global success is not for me. All of us um, are, are, are capable of being very excited by envy. The news doesn't help us with this. Um, if I was redesigning the news, we need help with envy. Now, the important thing about envy is because of the Christian heritage, we still think that envy is very bad and that we shouldn't really mention it. Um, it's very important to face up to the fact, of course, we feel envious, and the news is a major generator of envy. Now, envy is a vital but confused guide to your future self. It contains, within envious attacks, there's always a clue as to what you might be doing or should be doing next. Um, but it tends to be very confused. So um, we, need, you know, we need to keep diaries of envy. We need to write down everybody who ever made us, makes us envious and study what the underlying patterns are. Because if, you, you know, if I study this man, actually, I don't really want to you know, send people to Mars. That's never been my ambition. So what am I envious about? And actually, I'm very happily married, so I don't really you know, want his wife either. It's something more subtle. I admire his, his energy, his sense of courage, his enterprise, you know, whatever it is. We need to get more accurate. And yet, so often, 
when the news is faced with somebody who has achieved, um, there's very little connection between you, the reader, and their uh, achievement. We are not helped with the envy that the news so reliably and regularly uh, uh, generates. Now, another thing about the news is that higher up the hierarchy of um, uh, from, you know, unserious to serious you go, the more at the top of the hierarchy you get the argument that um, news, uh, when it's serious, is unbiased. So you get this in this most articulate demonstration with the BBC, who always vaunt themselves as saying, well, we are an unbiased uh, news source. And what does this mean? It means that they're very interested in laying down before us facts without, you know, messing with them. Just, it's just going gonna, it's, it's gonna to tell us, you know, here's a man who believes in uh, genital mutilation, and here's a person who's against genital mutilation. And we, the BBC, are just, you know, just presenting you with the fact. We're not trying to influence you or distort you. This seems insane. Um, uh, it seems crazy to try and run away from bias. Bias has got uh, a very bad name because we imagine it to be all about Fox News and uh, Daily Mail, etc. Um, but really, bias just means a take on information. And... Um, <coughs> You know, what we need is not no bias, but good bias. Uh, bias in favour of the things that we like. I'm saying we, and you might go, well, who are you? Just uh, um, we in this room, because we're all nice people and we believe in certain things. I, I don't know that for sure, but I just have a hunch that we do. Um, so I'm just getting out there, because I don't believe in kind of postmodern relativism where I have no idea what you think, and etc. I think that people can agree on things, and there's broad agreement as to what the good might be. Um, but because of this terror about being biased. Um, uh, a very powerful media organization at the center of our society has run away from one of its great, great uh, uh, challenges. You see this particularly in relation to economics. You know, economic re news reporting, which should be one of the most fundamental issues, is handled with kid gloves by most news organizations who tend to focus in on the very uh, uh, you know, nuts and bolts, nitty gritty, small scale issues of, of, e of economics. You know, um, uh, should we uh, uh, you know, raise or lower taxation by 1% or 2% or should we um, uh, raise in interest rates, etc. Now, these issues, of course, they have their, their importance, but the really important issues about how should our societies be structured, um, how does this economic machine work, um, how could we make things better? You know, a lot of us go to bed at night sometimes thinking, how could the world be nicer? Um, how could we improve things properly, not just tinkering in the margins, but, you know, uh, uh, really properly make a change? And sometimes that those very big, naive questions which we have around economics um, are not properly handled by the news, and yet they will explode uh, in people occasionally. So, you know, the Occupy movement in many ways was an explosion of confusion around injustice, economic injustice. Um, but its tragedy was that it was completely lacking in ideas. Um, it's, uh, the ideas which are out there are not properly propagated through society. There are lots and lots of very sensible, good ideas. People often go, so, are you a Marxist? Are you, are you talking about Mar you know, as, though, as though it's like, well, either it's the current order or it's Marxism. And it's like, no, no, guys, there are, there are hundreds of things that one could do in the economic system. The thing is, you wouldn't know it from watching the BBC or following uh, the, the, the mainstream news. These issues are oddly leached from the political system, and they have uh, really big consequences which explode into this kind of desperately well-intentioned, but desperately naive kind of outburst. The thing about the news is that it's obsessed by bad eggs. It, it, it's obsessed by the Watergate paradigm, which associates everything that's wrong in society with um, a few bad eggs who've done some things wrong, and you can try and identify them, and then put handcuffs on them, and then take them to jail, and all will be you know, well. Um, the thing is that most of the things that are really wrong with our society you can't bundle someone in a prison van and take them away. They're, they are systemic problems that arise not from evil or crookedness, but from lazy thinking, lack of inspiration, etc. And the news is very bad at seeing systemic problems. I mean, think of the housing crisis. Um, you know, the housing crisis is one of the most uh, important crises that are facing uh, uh, you know, people in, in the south of England. Um, and, um, and yet, you couldn't put anyone in prison uh, for causing this, this problem. It's, it's a kind of, it's not a neat story. And as we know, the news likes a story, needs a story, etc. So we need to get away from this kind of um, quick bundling into the van version of, of journalism. The other thing, of course, just to kind of tie things up, the other thing, of course, that we need to do is to remember that um, not everything that makes it into the news is important, and not everything that is important makes it into the news. We have this rather trusting, um, obedient sense that what is in the headlines must be important. We need to step back and realize that there are many, many important things out there that don't make it into the headlines for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, you know, we've got a vision that 
everything that is important happened in the last 24 hours. Um, there's an enormous amount of knowledge, wisdom, examples um, if from way back. And we're such a future-centered society um, that we have to remind ourselves of the importance of looking back, mining unfamiliar areas. Um, in order to keep our lives and our societies intact, we need people who are burrowing in unfamiliar areas. The news is a, 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 an amazing monoculture. Despite the unbelievable proliferation of news outlets, it is still extraordinary how certain big questions are still not found uh, within this plethora of of news outlets. And when we've said everything we can about the news, we also need to remember that it's extremely important to spend time away from it. The news Sabbath is one of the most important things to do. Most of us, if we get a chance, um, can do a news Sabbath on, um, on an aeroplane. Let's hope that Wi-Fi is never installed in, in aircraft, because um, it's one of the few times that you um, are left alone with your thoughts. And of course, being left alone with your thoughts is, is very anxiety inducing. You don't know what you'll discover, envy, regret, anxiety, etc. Um, but it's very important because once you start to look with your own eyes rather than through that filter of the news, you start to see all sorts of weird and unexpected things uh, uh, out there. That's really my message. Um, a personal message too. I'm a philosopher by uh, training. And um, the thing about philosophers is that they see themselves as the purveyors of the truth and a um, long tradition of heroic philosophers who've had command of very, very important truths and they got to prison and died and lived for the truth. The problem is that the average book of philosophy nowadays sells 300 copies uh, and the Daily Mail has 40 million daily readers. So you've got 300 million, uh, so you've got 40 million people and 300 uh, who are reading the serious stuff. Now, what is, what are we to do about this situation, um, this gap between importance and uh, uh, um, uh, popularity? Um, well, I was thinking about this with some philosopher friends the, uh, a while ago, a few months back, and, and we were thinking about this, this sort of difference between the Daily Mail on the one hand and the works of philosophy on the other. And then I cooked up this crazy scheme, which I put into action, um, and we thought, well, why not make a philosopher's version of the Daily Mail? So this is what we did. Um, we started it uh, a, a, a few weeks ago, and it's called the Philosopher's Mail, and it looks at everything that the Daily Mail looks at. We look at all the stories in the Daily Mail, from Taylor Swift to etc., um, and we cover them in a totally different way. So I urge you to look at philosophersmail.com. Uh, you'll learn lots of things, and you'll have fun too, because they're all, all the characters are there, all the murders, etc. But we take it in an unusual direction. It's a practical application of some of the ideas uh, uh, in my book. Now. I've gone on too long, I think, because I know the time's really limited. But thank you so much. I think we've got time for questions with Matthew, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was uh, uh, wonderful. Um, so a couple of questions from me before we open it up to the room. Is this fundamentally uh, an issue of motive? which is that you want the motive of those who produce the news to be a high-minded motive, when the motive of the people who produce the news is a very simple motive, which is to maximise sales, viewers. That, I mean, I, you know, I have yeah. dealt with these institutions, and that is really what drives them. And, and they, they have no choice but to be driven by that, because if they don't succeed, they will lose their jobs. Or, or they will lose their viewers to somebody else. Um, I don't think it's a simple opposition between high-minded and low-minded, you know, between money and high-minded ideals, because the interesting thing is if you scratch the heart, if you open up the heart of a Daily Mail journalist or a uh, Telegraph journalist or you know, any of these commercial, big commercial organisations, um, they're remarkably idealistic. Oh, my goodness, they're idealistic. They're quite moralistic. They will say, yes, you know, we've just written this story and we've just done this, but we are making the nation better by um, uh, holding power to account. Uh, the interesting thing about journalists is they are not devoid of a very uh, high sense of their moral purpose. I they think they're capable, they're, they are uniquely capable of rationalisation. Yes, absolutely. But I also think they've got the wrong moral purpose. Because I don't think the task of journalism is to hold power to account. I mean, the number one motive. I think that ultimately, if you had to say, what is journalism about? I think it's to give us information which will help the nation to flourish and the individual to flourish. Now, some of that may mean sometimes holding power to account. Of course it does. But it may also mean all sorts of other things. Um, it may mean making us more tolerant at times. It may mean teaching us lessons in forgiveness. Uh, it may mean um, uh, running stories that actually highlight other sides of, uh, you, know, you know, the benevolence of power. You know, if you know, a, a well-functioning society needs people to trust its leaders, 
right? To some extent, you need, otherwise you can't function. I mean, it's like being on a ship where everyone thinks the captain's evil. It, it, it's like you can't have this system. It becomes dysfunctional. So but that's uh, a collective action problem, isn't it? Because it, yeah. it, what you're talking about is the, is the overall function that the news might achieve, but that doesn't... It, it, that's not something that an individual can implement. The individual will say, okay, well, I think that's, how, that's what the system as a whole ought to provide, but I individually yeah. have a much narrower kind of uh, compass. So th this takes you to the question of the fact that the news media as a whole is a highly fragmented space, in becoming ever more fragmented. Yeah. And therefore, the ability, if you talk about you know, energy companies, you mm -hmm. could conceivably get energy companies together and say, look, you've collectively got to have some kind of policy which reconciles your need to raise money with issues like climate change or whatever. And, and they could develop a, a method of doing that. It, it is inconceivable that you can get the news media to come together in that kind of way, isn't it? Um, in the way that it struck, look, I'm a, you know, appalling optimist, really. Um, I think that, I think a lot of these things have got to do with ideas. I mean, after all, this is why the institution exists, partly. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, these big machines, um, are often not thinking straight about what their goals are. And, and I agree with you, the obstacles can, on a bad day, seem enormous. But on another day, you know, part of the reason why I wrote this book and tried to kickstart the conversation is just um, to, uh, to try and get journalists to think a little bit more deeply about what their responsibilities and role in society is. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, this book has been reviewed four times by four leading journalists who've all said it's crap. But they've said it in very defensive ways. They've said, no, we're doing a great job. We always report on foreign news. Uh, no, we've done, you know, we do everything great. And, and it's all fine. Thank you very much. Now, this actually excites me because we're on to a big point. Um, journalists are very self-righteous and they are imbued by a very strong sense of their own moral uh, high ground. But at the same time, they are deeply vulnerable. The Leveson inquiry was not, I think, about what it seemed to be about. It was not about... Um, whether journalists were hacking phones or not. Really what it was about, underlying it, the emotional pull was what sort of a media have we got and what sort of a media might we have. I think it expressed a pent-up longing among not just elites but general, general public to have a better news machine. And I think for journalists to stand up and go, well, everything's fine and it's all great, is really proper arrogance. You see, this, this takes me to, to, to the thing that I, I can't... I can't work out looking, re reading the book, reading those rather grumpy reviews, which is that let, let, surely we'd agree that what's going on here is a folly à deux. That the, the media are providing us with what we think, what they, what we they think we want, yeah. and we're saying, and that's not really what we want. But when they try and provide us with what we say we really want, we don't seem to really want it. And so we're kind of locked in this kind of folly à deux. And you've produced a brilliant book in order to try to get us all to break out of this, um, yeah. be, because. It doesn't look as though, for example, when we as individuals have the opportunity to choose something different, yeah. we do. Uh, on the internet, as you say, uh, we gravitate towards people who share our prejudices rather than yeah. people who might challenge our prejudices. Yeah. On the internet, we have a actually a much greater ability than we ever had before to delve behind stories into the deeper stuff. You know, you yeah. can, if you want to spend, you can read any newspaper article now, you can spend two hours just yeah. following the links and getting a full rounded understanding of the kind you recommend. Nobody does it. Yeah. Um, look, you're, you're touching on a really big issue. Um, we could, at this point, despair. Um, I think really what you're saying is, um, what do we do next? You know, if we've got these high ideals, what do we do next? Um, the typical response is to write a book and to say, you know, this is what I think, and to try and energise people. But as we know, this book could become the biggest bestseller. Let's imagine it became a huge... I've got my uh, dear editor in the audience. Um, uh, it's been the biggest bestseller. It sold, you know, 100,000 copies. You know, that would be the... The great hope. That's nothing. You don't change anything with 100,000 copies. Um, when you're dealing with people who are dealing in the millions, um, I, this does keep me up at night. Um, I think, um, you know, the famous uh, comment in Plato that the world will come right when kings are philosophers or philosophers are kings, um, and it will only come right at that point. Um, I think nowadays the modern world will only come right when uh, philosophers become media magnates or, or media magnates become philosophers. Um, I'm being playful, but serious. Um, I think we've got to brain up the way that news is produced. Not, I'm not recommending, I mean, look, I, I, we started the Philosopher's Mail, we got, we got a million hits uh, in the first three days. Um, that's nice. Now, the reason we got a million hits is that we weren't running stories about, uh, you know, a disaster here or there in a, in, in, in a kind of way that The Guardian might. 
we got that kind of traffic because we were having fun, but with really serious intent. Um, and I think that people who care about good things nowadays have to be so nimble about getting it across. We, we live in a world which all hierarchies have broken down. If you stand up and go, I've got a very, very important thing to tell you. Uh, you know, it's dark and difficult. I will speak for three hours on the topic, etc. There isn't an audience in a way that there was 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. We're living in an age of mass distraction, lack of hierarchical respect, etc. How do you try and make a change in this world? Um, it's really, really difficult. I think one of the solutions is uh, to look at what you're up against and not to run away from um, some of the techniques that your opponents are using. If your opponents are using beautiful ladies, maybe use a beautiful lady. Maybe you'll need to do that. Um, that's what the Catholic Church realized. Um, I wrote a book about religion before this book, and what fascinated me about religions is they are giant machines for changing people's minds. I don't believe in the way in what they're teaching people, but I'm fascinated by the way they try and change people's minds because um, they operate at so many levels. They use art and architecture. They use ritual. Um, and I think that you know, intellectuals uh, are only just beginning to cotton on to what you need to do to change mentalities. Last question before we open it up, which is, and all this is around the same area, but I just want to come at it from a different perspective. If we agree that both heroin and pornography are bad things, it's quite interesting, isn't it? When we talk about heroin as a bad thing, we don't blame the heroin. When we talk about pornography as a bad thing, we do blame the pornography. Yeah. So is, is news heroin or pornography in that sense? And I think in the book you kind of have it both ways, because mm. the book starts out mm. as a kind of way for us to understand that if we have this dangerous substance, it's going to be bad for us. So that's yeah. a kind of, you yeah. know, and then it turns into a bit more of a critique of the thing in itself. And I'm, I'm not sure, are you telling us it's really up to us to resist this thing? Because this thing is just out there, like heroin yeah. is just out there, we've got to resist it. Or is it, are you saying, no, there's something really pernicious about this thing and the thing has to change because we are victims of it. Yeah, look, I, I, I do think that it's a bit of both. I mean, to take your example, it's the McDonald's situation, right? What do you do about McDonald's? So right-thinking people think, oh, people shouldn't eat McDonald's because it's very unhealthy. So the, the, the first view is to legislate some against... Some people say it's right. We don't want to get right. sued. Okay, no, no. You know, some, some, people some, people, right. some people say um, uh, that it's... Uh, so, so in other words, one answer is the legislative, we must shut McDonald's, it's, it's terrible, etc. And the other people say, look, ultimately, the people who are responsible for McDonald's are us. We're responsible because we eat there. In other words, the target is consumer education rather than producer legislation. Uh, and I do think it's a bit of both. Um, but certainly, and this is a book about the consumer, for the consumer, um, of news. Um, yes, if we got a bit cleverer. Um, I, I, I went on Newsnight the other night and I said, you know, the thing about uh, news is that we get so little training in um, how to handle it and how to look at it. And um, then I, I seem to have upset every single media studies uh, uh, um, a professor in the, in the country. There are only about 15, um, but I seem to have upset them. The, of course, there is this thing called media studies. Media studies is really, really important. Um, it's seen as a sort of Mickey Mouse degree. It's not. It's very, very serious. Um, to become properly, you know, because the media is so central, to become properly literate in it is absolutely essential. And I think one of the solutions is to brain up and, 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 and amplify um, efforts to uh, kind of develop people's intelligence around their consumption of news. What it does to us, it, it does all sorts of things, and we should just be aware of it. I think you need a metric, you see. I think you need, a, you need an intelligent news metric, which would enable you somehow to give us feedback loops so that we could see that we were slightly, the, the, the news had become slightly more intelligent this year. Yeah. Give us hope that we were on some kind of path to a more intelligent news world. Sure. Okay. Yeah. okay, let's take some questions and points. The audience, by the way, is made up of people who are nasty and experts on Peru. So I didn't... Uh, <laughs> um, don't be surprised yeah, by okay. that. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, where's the mic? There. Right, can we go right to the front here? Thank you. Um, Jeremy Kaplan, fellow of the RSA. Um, my question is, you used a word a few times during your conversation there, um, norms. And isn't one of the fundamentals of this, as humans, we tend towards the norm. So media, so media companies will see celebrities, they'll show celebrities. To your point about Congo, though, the, the interesting day will be when the newspapers are reporting that nobody was killed in Africa, or there wasn't a bomb blowing up in the Middle East. Mm. So 
are we tracking the right thing and isn't it all about norms because the word news inherently has something new mm -hmm. something different and therefore reporting norm is not interesting to us and doesn't teach us anything uh, absolutely um uh, you know, we, we know this intellectually, we know it in our karma moments. The stories that are in the news are not reality. I mean, it's a basic and, and simple sounding point, and yet we should, you know, it should be written in large letters above Trafalgar Square. It's not the news, it's some news. It's some news masquerading as the news. Um, and we keep forgetting this. Um, but of course that's the case. Um, you know, in the 19th century, Flaubert was outraged at the spread of news. He thought the news was making us idiotic. And the reason he thought that was uh, he believed that it was hammering the consciousness. He was, he was obsessed by clichés, and he believed that it was making our souls clichétic. Um, that up until the spread of mass media, which is really a 19th century development, um, people used to think all sorts of things in, in all sorts of ways, and then it started getting hammered into standardised shapes. Um, and uh, this is where we are. And I think... It's a very simple point, but we need to keep reminding ourselves of it, of course. Um, and when societies go wrong, it's always because uh, there have not been enough outliers looking for slightly unusual trends, seeing the things that don't quite fit the paradigm of the moment. Um, yeah. But isn't this also the point that we were talking about before we came in, actually, which is that, by definition, news identifies those things which are unusual, those things which are unusual are untypical, so the news is always about those things which aren't actually true, in a sense. Well, yes, they're not, they're not, you know, so, they're so, not. So British news is dominated by the weather because our weather's very nice. Yeah. If you go yeah. to Finland, they don't care about the weather because yeah. it's grim. Yeah. And they're just, right. that's, just, that's just, you know, you don't go to Finland, they're that's big right. stories saying it's freezing cold and there's loads of snow because that's, that's right. just living in Finland. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And we hear about murders basically because people are very peaceable. Yeah. Um, and actually, I was in Uganda for this book, and the interesting thing is the way they cover murders are so euphemistic, because there's an outbreak of uh, violence. And so when there's a real outbreak of violence, people, are, people behave very differently around crime stories. Uh, John Nugent, um, do you think part of the problem is that the news is uh, by necessity mass? So it has to work for as many people as possible at the same yeah. time. Yeah. And the internet changes that. Uh, I mean, I get most of my news from Twitter these days, and I've curated all the things that interest me, including uh, your Twitter feed. Thank um, you. So, so for me, I get a very different, and I avoid uh, the mass media as much as... Are you more narrow-minded, though? Uh, every now and again, I refresh. So I, li I, like, to, yeah. I like to follow a cadence to, to what I'm doing. But, so, so I think part of the problem is, is the mass uh, approach. Uh, and also, the, just another point, the lack of clarity as to the mechanics of how the stories are chosen. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, uh, on that last point, how stories are chosen, you know, the, the extraordinary thing is, is, is whenever you go into a newsroom, um, and I've spent quite a bit of time now in newsrooms, um, they're always looking at other people's news. So they're not, they're not going out to sort of look at the world. They are just looking at each other, as we know. Um, and they're obsessed by not missing the story that's big on somebody else's channel. And so the agenda is this kind of stew of received opinion that's not properly uh, looked at. I mean, you know, the good news outlets should lead with stories that you've never heard about, um, but how few do. You know, it's, it's, um, it, you know, it's lowest common denominator stuff, but there is great hope in technology here, there really is. Um, and we've heard it so often that we forget to realize that we really are in a new age when we can curate news for us. Um, there are dangers to personalized news, of course. You know, Google News, I mean, the, 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 the promise, the kind of utopian promise is you can be fed a diet of the news that really matters to you and that's important to you. The question is, if that's really to work, you have to understand yourself really well. Um, for example, you know, take envy. Uh, uh, you, know, you might say, oh, well, I never want to feel envious because it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but you might actually need stories of envy. So in order to program your Google News monitor, you really need to do it with the help of a psychoanalyst um, who would properly understand what news you need, which may involve you know, going really quite deep into you. So yes, like all choice, yes, personalized news is good, but um, it doesn't just mean sliding a little bar across you know, the thing going, you know, give me more sport. I mean, I, it's a really big promise, and I think you know, when we finally got those helmets that will tell us how we work and how our brains work, etc., we will probably reach an age when we will be fed information that is properly helpful to us. Uh, at the moment, we're still kind of cobbling it together quite roughly, dealing with our failures of self-knowledge and 
the news machine's failure of societal knowledge. There's a lot of error in the system. But, yes, possible we're getting, going in the right direction. And isn't it important to make a distinction between uh, attempts by the news or the internet to make something interesting to you by making it personally relevant to you, which is fine, mm. because that's how literature works as well, mm. and pandering to you. So, for example, it wouldn't be good for me if all I ever got was, was, was feeds that told me West Bromwich Albion were fantastic, because that's pandering to me. But it would be all right if it was country where West Bromwich Albion player comes from has had earthquake, because it would make me more interested in the earthquake, because it would start with something that I cared about. And, and we, there's an important distinction there, isn't there, between different forms of personalisation. Yes, absolutely. Um, in, in a way, it's, it's the idea, we come back to the idea of information, that news should be information that helps you and the nation to grow towards its best version of itself. Sounds really pretentious, but let's imagine that. Then absolutely, you need um, to make sure that you're not pandering to, you know, easy narcissistic stroking or, or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, but as for the technique, um, you know, I think we do need to look at art. I mean, it, it is, you know, artists are able to make us care about people who lived 500 years ago, will be crying about their fate, etc. The news can't even get us to care about someone who died yesterday um, uh, because it's not alive to what you need to do in order to get somebody to care about something. OK, uh, let's take... Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three questions together. And uh, uh, so uh, there's a gentleman there, and then we'll take the lady in the hat. Hi, my name is Alan Newland, a fellow of the, the, the RSA. Um, when journalists talk about news, they talk about stories. And going back to your reference to Aristotle and our need to understand through tragedy, through fear and pity, uh, just to take that through, do you, think, do you think news is cathartic? It doesn't seem to me that it is. Um, hold, on, hold on to that. Is yeah. news cathartic? Yeah. Yep. Uh, having researched your roots, um, you do speak French and German. When um, you conducted the, uh, the, the research for the book, did you reserve it only to the English-speaking world, or did you actually migrate to the continent? Very interesting question. Mm. Different national mm. news cultures. Mm. And then who's the... We'll take the gentleman there. Um, I'm a little confused about the comment that you made earlier on about journalists being high-minded. Uh, I can see that, for example, where we have stories about Liz Hurley and whether or not she had a relationship with Clinton and how many uh, children Hugh Grant has may have some kind of moral aspect, you know, about, the, about power and celebrity and so forth. I can't quite see where you were showing pictures of Taylor Swift's legs what could possibly be considered high-minded, and that the person who took the picture and then the person who decided that that would be in the newspapers was put it, was doing that other than because they thought that that would sell more newspapers. Mm -hmm. Nothing high-minded there, mm -hmm. I don't think. Okay, so catharsis, international comparison, and aren't you being a little bit kind to the motives of newspaper editors? Um, well, uh, catharsis, look, I, I think that there is definitely the possibility of achieving a catharsis. Um, what, what, what frustrates me is, again, I, I said this in the talk, the news takes us to the edge often of very important things and doesn't quite do the last step. Um, it's at the level of horror rather than tragedy. And, and, and in Aristotle's view, it, that, the bits haven't been tied together. A horror story that hasn't been tied together stays at the level of the horror. Uh, a, a tragedy is simply a horror story that's been tied together properly, that's taken us through the road of catharsis. And you could do that, but as I said, the problem is the fear of sympathy uh, in the news. Um, and also, there's the f that just people are unaware, I think, of the, the deeper possibilities that are, that are available. I mean, um, every time you get a car crash, I mean, if I was you know, running the news, um, you know, you'd have a section called Memento Mori. Uh, and under Memento Mori, it would say, you know, five people died on the M1 today. Um, that is an opportunity for quite deep feelings. And I think that um, these... These stories excite us because we know that there's something quite important close by, but the news doesn't help us to kind of prise it open. Um, so I think a lot of it is raw material waiting to be properly dealt with. And it tends to be only the novelists, the filmmakers, who come along after the news, who do this other thing. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, the news should be run by novelists, but... I think that the news can take some lessons. What is it that these novelist people are doing? Um, 
uh, you know, there's, there's some interesting lessons that I think the newsroom could learn. Um, it would make the stuff that they're going out to collect very assiduously more resonant and more important in our lives. Um, Comparison, yeah. Uh, foreign yeah. news, uh, or, or other, other news sources. Um, other countries, uh, different, other countries, countries different, different, different national different cultures. Different cultures. Um, look, I think what one finds in other European nations is greater seriousness. Um, I think that uh, there is, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon Anglo media, is, is a little bit embarrassing. Um, and uh, you talk to sort of Germans about um, serious newspapers, they go, oh, I, I saw this article in The Times. Isn't, isn't The Times uh, a paper of, of record? And you try and explain, well, no, things have happened to it, and uh, it's not quite you know, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. So, um, yes, I think that places like Germany, to some extent France, to some extent Italy, have still got an architecture of news. They've still got the capacity capacity to bring uh, a, a, an important sized audience to a, a, a big issue. Um, I'm sorry to say it's probably going to crumble in those countries too, um, but I think they're sort of maybe 10 years behind us. Um, the third question was, question. yes, aren't you being a bit charitable about, about journalists and their high-minded... Um, you know, the question is, okay, what would decode you... Decode the high-mindedness of Taylor Swift's left legs. Yeah, or, or, or rather, okay, the question is, what could you do with that? If you were, you know, if you had Tolstoy in the room or Bellini in the room, and somebody said, "Okay, so what are we going to do with Taylor Swift?" Um, I mean, why do anything? Why do anything? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, in in the Philosopher's Mail the other day, there was in the Daily Mail there were 15 pictures that were run of Anne Hathaway, the actress, walking her dog on a sunny day in LA. She was walking through a field with pretty flowers, um, and there were 15 pictures, and the Mail. The copy was extraordinary because it kept saying uh, Anne Hathaway, who acted in this film, um, her chocolate, her dog, her chocolate coloured Labrador is called this, etc. Sort of weird text, like sort of eerie, sort of just bizarre text. Um, uh, and then these pictures, it was almost as though the Daily Mail didn't quite know why its audience, it knew that its audience is excited by these pictures, it doesn't quite know why. Now, one of you say you want to have sex with Anne Hathaway, but I don't think, it, well, I mean, some people do, but I, I, I think it's something else. It's quite nice in a world that's, you know, strife torn, etc., to look at a picture of a quite attractive person on a sunny day walking their dog. Now, if you put a frame around that and take that to the museum, you know, and get it painted by Monet, and, um, you know, it's a walk in Argenteuil or something, um, suddenly it becomes quite serious, and it's like, oh, of course, it's a beautiful day, somebody walking in a field, that's absolutely fine. But, oh, no, it's a celebrity. Oh, awful celebrity, right? So I go, well, you know, there's clearly an appetite sometimes in this, you know, war-riven world for um, pictures of people who, you know, it's quite nice. Um, someone has just uh, gone to take a, take a walk, etc. So, maybe, you know, a nice picture of the day. But what I'm talking about, you know, the gentleman over there was saying... The, the news doesn't seem aware enough of its own psychology or the psychology of its viewers. And so it can't, it, it just parades this stuff and doesn't quite know where to take it. Now, uh, what matters about your work, Alain, of course, is the quality of the ideas. And so it wouldn't really matter if this book was roughly printed and badly copied. Uh, but for some reason, you've decided that your ideas might spread more quickly if they were an incredibly beautiful book full of fantastic photographs and illustrations and stuff like that. So it's a lovely it's artifact, a as well, yes. ob an object, as well as a set of ideas. I'm saying that because it's available outside. Um, and Alan will sign it uh, with a headline of your choosing. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic session. Thank you all for coming and the questions that you asked. But most of all, uh, can I ask you to join me in thanking Alan de Botton. Thank you.